Hi, and welcome to Creative by Constantine, where we give you life hacks from music's best. Today, I have a very interesting and multi-talented guest, Michael Bulichov oxer who is a pianist, composer, promoter, teacher, and a founder of a festival and an international competition. And we're going to talk about combining all of this, the experience in and life in music on both sides of the stage, in front of the people and in the wings. Michael, welcome. Hi, uh, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here on this wonderful podcast with Constantine and to share my view on music and experiences. Well, it's wonderful to have you. Great to have you. And of course, um, well, we go way back. So we know each other from Moscow, from the special music school that we both attended back in the dark ages of the 90s. Absolutely. It was a when, fun time. Oh, it was. It was. But it feels like it was literally uh, in another life. And it was in another millennium. When did you come to the United States? Well, I came uh, here actually right in the middle of the 90s and 96. <laughs> so it was... Uh, uh, as you can imagine, big uh, stretch and big transfer, not just in music, but in entire life and consciousness, because moving to America, it was completely uh, different. And I remember the first uh, thing that struck me uh, when I was um, on a car from New York airport, uh, right from Moscow, is a change in the architecture. <laughs> because, you know, in Moscow, we used to have this monumental Stalin uh, built houses and coming to New York, we find, I found out it was completely different and it was also so beautiful in its own sense. But I remember how uh, shockingly struck I was by just seeing those styles, change style of architecture around me. Of course, but you mentioned consciousness and uh, how does that, um, uh, was that a big adjustment or did you have to rethink uh, certain things, or was it more of a, a kind of a smooth transition? Well, uh, I guess it was pretty much both, if I can use these two contrasting terms. Uh, and I can talk a little bit about what was uh, rough and what was smooth. Well, definitely, uh, smooth parts that I was still with the music, and uh, I was just engulfing, embracing you. Um, perspectives and impressions that were coming uh, to me as a creative uh, artist, as a pianist, like an avalanche. Uh, <laughs> during the winter, uh, you know, I was at that time living as part of New York City in Brooklyn, which is not so well-known uh, neighborhood in terms of architecture. And then uh, three days after my arrival, I go to Manhattan, right uh, in the heart where it was, uh, uh, Carnegie Hall, and right across it, we still had this rotunda, the Stanley Hall. And my teacher at the time, uh, he actually uh, uh, gave me a possibility through his common friend to study and to practice at the Stanway home, because at that time I didn't have any piano. So every day, um, or I would say every other day, I was uh, making a trip there, and I remember it was so shocking to see after this like small building, this huge Carnegie Hall tower. So what I did, I stood kind of right um, uh, on the bottom of it and just uh, kind of put my head far above. Well, that's the best vantage point to, to look at skyscrapers is looking yes, right and, up from and, the bottom, yeah. And at that time I was especially not used to it. So it felt like this skyscraper was actually slowly um, actually falling on, on my head. And that was one of the impressions. It was the time when I actually wrote uh, one of my first compositions, uh, pre-recorded, which was uh, New York Subway at night. Because uh, every time I was returning from Stanway, it was night and I went into this piece, all these syncopated turns and twists. And it was kind of uh, my perception of New York at that time. Also this is so cool. 
So cool. So your first experience of looking at the skyscraper and traveling in New York subway translated into a music piece. Yes, yes. And uh, of course, uh, it was a uh, completely different country, uh, uh, different tastes. I cannot say that they were worse or better. Uh, you know, each country is valuable by its own means, to my point of view, at least. But it was just a different, different change. And um, we, I, at that time, I was very relatively young. So it was a smooth transition in terms of psychology. I adapted quickly. Right. Well, you were a teenager then, correct? Yes, yes. I was just 14, 15, and it was uh, all getting used to part was very smooth. <laughs> right. Well, that's, look, it, it's, it's already an age where you're self-aware. So, you know, when children are abroad to another country, they just kind of adapt right away. But as a teenager, it's already starting to, you, you had a real uh, sort of life and understanding of things in Russia, and then you had to translate that. Um, to yes, uh, and in, but even back in Russia, I had a great deal of artistic life already at that age. Uh, it was a time when I, you know, was in, the, I will use the uh, terms that is very hyper now, in the bubble uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, central special school with all these talented kids, and including you, Kostya, although we were, I think, in parallel grades. Yeah, and we were basically yeah. just uh, you know living in in our own creative society and environment with all these parents. And uh, already at that time, you know, my teacher at that time uh, she took us for trips around Russia, and I went to what we called. Uh, mission is Toki, so it was like a, a trip on a ship to Mediterranean, Greece, Turkey, Israel, mm -hmm. and Egypt. And it was an unforgettable experience. I was uh, 12 at that time. And okay. so I had something uh, to experience even when I was living in Russia and with all these concerts. And uh, of course, um, at the time when I moved here first year I didn't have any but then they sl slowly started to accumulate so it was uh, something to live and it was something to gain in a new world just to summarize of course no it's always just very interesting how people find their way into their uh, real uh, authentic true life that they live as an adult um, because there are no two journeys that are alike but there are certain similarities uh, of course, and shared experiences. But um, tell me, when did you start composing? Well, you know, just answer since I remember myself, just like when I started playing piano. But in truth, uh, my composition came possibly two years after I was um, consciously trying to play piano. And I tried to play piano when I was five, six, like very early. And um, partially my grandmother showed me what to do. And uh, uh, like in a year or two, I was very quick at learning notes and she admitted that. And then she started to lock down the piano out of me. So I wouldn't overplay my hands because uh, when kids are really getting good at something, you know what they do, they, they get really curious and they start to go to high, 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 high incrementally high levels. And uh, she didn't want me to play a piece like uh, least uh, Rhapsody number, Hungarian Rhapsody number six, because I barely could reach at these octaves with my right hand. So she said, you're going to overplay your hand. Please stop. And then she started to lock it down. From right. Me. Yeah, I love that. And, and then, of course, uh, by, by, sorry to interrupt you, but by overplay, what you're referring to is a, a repetitive stress injury. Uh, yeah, uh, that I would get an early tendinitis or something right. like that, and I, I would not like uh, be able to continue into that, and she really wanted me to, and I loved it too. So I transferred to something mild, and that's at the time, you know, again, referring to the uh, Moscow in the 90s, when we had a lot of these power outages. I don't know if you had them living in the end, if you remember, uh, but it was really not stable times. And I think power outages were also going uh, throughout the entire Soviet Union. And uh, but, well, I needed to practice, so I didn't give a damn about it. And I just sat down at the piano and I played in virtually complete darkness. That's how I learned to 
really uh, feel the keyboard uh, in my fingers and my fingers used to find uh, where they were going. At that time, I also started uh, to improvise unconsciously because I was so bored with these piano pieces. And uh, I started to just put together some motifs or notes. And then how, it's how it grew into improvising. And then I started to write down some of these things uh, on a piece of paper. And then that's how my composition started. Amazing. Uh, I remember actually doing the same thing in terms of uh, playing in the darkness. And, um, and I really actually enjoyed doing it. So I got into it so much that I would turn out the lights when the electricity actually wasn't uh, out and mm -hmm. just sort of see how long I can play something in total pitch darkness. Um, it's a helpful thing not to have to stare at your hands all the time. Yeah, it also actually depends on the piece. If you play in a piece like La, La Campanella by Liszt, or if you play uh, La, La Grand Galop Chromatic, uh, it would be a bit of a problem. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, that's, I like the technique of sort of reverse psychology on, on the piano. So I always do uh, practice things that will never actually be happening in real life or they're the least likely things. Because if you can do that, then you really have extra security. So I actually practiced uh, Mephisto Waltz jumps oh. at the end in the darkness. Uh, Number one. And, and well, the, the, well, the big ones, you know, I, uh -huh. um, uh, the, you know, the ones that I'm talking about. The, the famous leaps that everybody is always worried about. And I was worried about them too, but once I learned how to play them in the dark without looking, I never had a problem there. Of course, I never had to play them yes. in the dark, but, yes. uh, but it's, hel it's a helpful thing to do whether or not you have electricity. <laughs> yeah, well, it would lead me to a bigger territory such as improvisation. And then uh, that's how I started to compose actually. And right. uh, I was then taken to Tihan Hrenikov, uh, who I played for some of my early works. And he's, uh, I don't know, he, he saw something in me. So my last few years in Russia were filled with uh, his lessons. And he just started to teach me he never would take money, but uh, at that time, uh, he was very strict. Like you, you actually were absolutely forced to go to uh, the conservatory to take lesson once a week at least. And it doesn't matter if it was like a snowy weather or it was uh, something else, you had to be there with some exceptions of holidays, of course. And uh, that was uh, something that I would never regret because uh, he was amazing teacher and he gave me a lot of um, foundation, especially when writing the melodies down. He was particularly famous for that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And when you came to the United States, did you continue with your formal compositional training? Yes, I did. But uh, uh, I had a bunch of uh, professors. Uh, the one that really influenced me uh, going. Um, Forward after the Hrenikov was uh, Philip Lesser. He's, you probably know him. He's a Julia. Of course, composer. I studied with him, yes. Uh, oh, so you know. And he's in, yeah. in, in tradition of Nadia Boulanger with all this counterpoint and uh, discoveries that he found in musical Brahms. Yeah. So I was absolutely fascinated in what he was doing. He also introduced me to the um, American uh, French Institute in Paris, in Les Colacant Room. Uh, where I actually went and studied for four months during summer and uh, got some diploma from that. And it's uh, somewhat influenced my uh, style, especially in local writing. My, uh, my romance started to be much more linear. And, you know, when you study all these works by Debussy and Ravel, it's absolutely amazing. Right. right. Uh, uh, so you, you are a prolific composer and arranger. What are you working on right now? Well, right now, uh, I'm, um, I didn't put a lot of uh, things uh, in the COVID time because honestly, I was, uh, when it first started, I'm like, I was trying to psychologically adapt to it. But now um, I am writing a piece that uh, may be very daring in terms of suspense. And at the same time, it goes, uh, um, follows the time frames that we're having right now. Because right now, what you what you basically produce is a lot of through media, which you can do on a computer, and you can only perform it uh, to large extent with with the technology. 
And um, my partner in uh, uh, violinist who is now living in Netherlands, she gave me an idea to do mm -hmm. that without knowing it. Uh, what what she try what she was trying to do is find the platform that could enable us to practice uh, while she's in the, uh, Amsterdam and I'm here without right. like interruption. And no matter what we try, FaceTime, Zoom or any other platforms, we would still have uh, internet lag because of the distance. Right. And then I started to think, well, if we can't really uh, cope with practicing and rehearsing, why don't I write a piece that would actually uh, have internet lag as a participant of the piece? because that can influence the time frame of how the piece is played. So currently I'm writing a piece which is called Monologue Q and it's, um, Q stands for quarantine. And it's about really monologue of two, uh, two instruments, piano and violin, uh, which are supposed to wait for each other and play the different time frame. Uh, there's a lot oh, of like tight notes, uh, there's a lot of fermatas, there's a lot of discrepancies, but these discrepancies are beautiful and they're part of the creative process when you actually transpire it through technology. Um, and the, I, I introduced that idea to some of the players and they uh, actually were fascinated. They said, why don't you do it for different instruments and you can have a, like a huge collage of uh, understanding how to play this and I'm trying to expand it into something bigger now and I think it's uh, in a time frame where we live right now it might be something interesting to experiment with. Of course that sounds really cool I love it that it's purposefully not in sync. Yes yes and uh, of course uh, I have a version where I uh, which would be performed post COVID uh, where everything is in sync and uh, it would sound actually <laughs> radical too because everybody would be using and waiting each other and now they don't have to do it anymore. Right. So there's some kind of uh, message to the future and philosophical context to that. Wonderful. Well, speaking of, of our times, um, have you been just in your house since the beginning of the lockdown? Well, uh, I I try to uh, really get the most out of uh, out of it. Uh, I think I went a couple of times to the beach because I live in uh, Nassau County in Westbury, where we can enjoy the warm weather. And uh, so, you know, on the beach, I know it's safe. At least they said so. And if you keep the distance, you're fine. You can swim and enjoy. In there, I went out a couple of times just uh, not to places where I would meet other people but there's uh, so many wonderful parks that you can enjoy things you can great, get creative inspiration from that um, but uh, I think uh, what really makes uh, me personally wondering is uh, how people different people adapt to that and I think a lot of work you can do with COVID time, which you were not able to do before. Um, for me, it also worked because I'm now writing a book about piano transcriptions and how they uh, translate in our art of Bach and beyond him. And uh, I know in the busy times that I had before the COVID with all this producing and performing, I was not able to really delve deeper into that. And right. fortunately I'm able to do it right now. Oh, this is great. Well, I, I concur. I, I feel that um, somehow I find myself busier than ever uh, with you know projects that you can do remotely. Uh, even the podcast that I've been thinking um, about for years and I've been encouraged to do it, but it was just not something that I could fit in until life grounded me. And uh, here we are. So, I mean, there are ways to use your time differently, but meaningfully. And also, I have to say that these moments when we left to ourselves are exploratory as well. Uh, I really don't mind sometimes just being on my own for, for some time because I seldom get to do that. And you just, we, I think we forget that, um, you know, you can have an inner dialogue with yourself. You don't always have to be in uh, constant socialization. 
that's how I felt myself too. When you you have so much uh, uh, going on in your life, you're trying to meet the deadlines uh, with projects, multiple projects that you're doing, and especially when you produce as many concerts as I was doing and performing and uh, self-promoting, because I believe the classical musicians should be able to do it uh, yourself, at least to try to learn how to. And when you get into that, it's uh, hundreds of emails and you have to kind of find time for it. And I wished uh, before the COVID there would be 48 hours for me, now the 24. <laughs> um, and now it's a kind of different a mindset and different flow of time. Kind of, we were, um, I, I would use a computer term. Uh, I feel like we had a system restore going back to at least a couple, many years ago. Right. Yeah. A reboot, partial reboot. Yeah. But at the same time, I think it would be unwise to think that this time uh, will stay with us forever. Because now well, with the news of vaccines, actually several of them being developed, uh, we're talking about uh, just if, uh, several months maybe ahead of us where we actually can use this time. So it would be a mistake not to think about uh, future without uh, this um, of course. I mean, COVID. So I was trying to plan also uh, for things that can happen post COVID and I was analyzing the uh, musical management and uh, just uh, the way uh, how many musicians are uh, sort of isolated in that and they just uh, trying to find their own niche and how to present themselves trying to find their own love uh, love mark which would get them out there and make them popular and I was trying to come up with some kind of solution for that well let's talk about that a little more because obviously you're not only a great performer yourself but you're a promoter and uh and and somebody who uh runs organizations how did that happen how did you come to realize that well it was uh, actually a coincidence <laughs> i was never uh trying to uh, to do something like that uh, if you uh, so so-called rewind the tape back seven years ago i was actually far from it and then um, just uh, with a, a colleague of mine who is a violinist and she lives in Brooklyn, New York, we sort of uh, established a competition uh, and, uh, in New York that would emphasize New York City as, as a value and would bring more people to participate. And I, know, and I knew there would be uh, several competitions. You have Nambourg, uh, you have uh, Concert Artist Guilds that have been established forever. But at the same time, I was searching for competition uh, that would have a name of composer, and I found none. And then we sort of idea, well, who do we name as a composer? And I started to see like names of famous American composers, and I, um, you know, I really started to browse, and I find out the amazing facts that George Gershwin, who is probably the most iconic composer, never had a competition for his name. And uh, well, there was just one event happening in Philadelphia in the early 2000s, and they sort of discontinued it for some reason. And I decided uh, that it, his music is so uh, diverse. Uh, I mean, the guy brought uh, all the American styles into one soup, basically, and uh, he also drew upon European styles and uh, indigenous styles such as. Uh, um, African-American uh, songs and uh, Jewish gospels. And he made it all available into his own music. So he basically defined an American lifestyle as we know it today. And I thought he really deserves to be uh, presented for the competition. And we established his name uh, for this. And uh, it also made uh, quite a unique combination of the repertoire because uh, everyone had to perform one piece by him and uh, alongside was classical repertoire which many people uh, felt new for them and but uh, they felt that the experience was amazing uh, because they could relax with the Gershwin music and it made them feel 
less tension and nervousness on stage, which was actually uh, the turning point. That's really interesting. So you're you're finding and you're saying that Blaine Gershwin and, and his style of music creates or rather alleviates the anxiety or creates more relaxation than playing a traditional classical repertoire? I would say so. And it's not because his music is close to jazz as many people would think. Uh, to me, his music is a combination of classical European traditions and uh, American uh, traditions of music which are cl close to jazz. And this unique combination, this amalgamation of styles is the one that makes uh, performers more relaxed and intuitively free in expression of what they sing. And I mean, it's not just only for the piano. I had interviews with participants who, for example, were vocalists and they also said, we love uh, doing uh, aria from Porgy and Bass alongside with Gershwin songs, and that's how they felt uh, themselves liberated from nerves, more or less. Oh, that is so interesting. That's a first. I mean, I played Gershwin myself, and I didn't necessarily think about it in those terms, but it's a very interesting uh, and insightful observation. It is remarkable that um, that Gershwin's music has this magic effect of relieving anxiety for performers but uh, and it's tremendous that you guys started a Gershwin competition I was following it since its inception actually and I uh, how frequently does it happen well I my initial plan was uh, doing it every single year but uh, after the first edition I quickly realized that it's virtually not possible especially with all my other projects that going on and uh, I decided that the comfortable time frame would be every two years, so it's a biannual competition. And um, I, it's also not just for piano, it's for voice, it's for strings, and we used to have an edition of winds and brass combined as one category. Uh, competing against each other and then it was so gigantic to have uh, four instrumental categories and three age group categories into one competition that uh, since the uh, last edition that took place uh, in uh, October, November 2019, I decided to do it just for uh, piano and voice and we'll see how it will basically run because we had participants coming from uh, all over the world, like in third competition, we had at least 35 countries applying, and a lot of them actually making a trip to New York City to participate, and we tried to make an experience for them more interesting than just coming to one venue and perform, uh, but uh, we did master classes for them, um, and we, uh, especially with uh, stars like Olga Kern, she gave a master class in a beautiful uh, cathedral in New York where the final round was held and uh, other musicians as well. And we had actually in uh, 2017 an amazing uh, artist uh, who is uh, probably one of the best uh, luminaries in America for not just Gershwin but American pop song who had a series of that on the PBS just presenting entire programs for that. And of course, I'm talking about Richard Glazier. Mm -hmm. he's, he's the one who presented um, a master class uh, via the uh, technology. So they put a huge screen inside the Engelmann Hall in Baroque Performing Arts Center. And he would just connect with the Skype at that time. And uh, they made it uh, visible for the audience and uh, they also had three pianists playing Gershwin for him live. And it was an amazing experience. Uh, oh, this is fantastic. So by the time it takes place, it's uh, probably take uh, time at least seven to 10 days in New York City. And it's like entire uh, festival of music, not just Gershwin, but for other people. And it's a lot of work. It's probably a preparation of at least six months with all these things that I have to put through uh, with yeah. jury and budgeting and organizational things. Uh, so it's never easy, but I hope this project will continue post-COVID. Well, te it. 
I'm sure it will. So essentially, it, it is scheduled for 2021. So it's sort of luckily bypassed 2020, correct? Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> you're you are on, so you are on track, right? You're not um, you're not thinking about rescheduling, and you're just hopefully everything is going to be fine by then, and it will be uh, as scheduled. Yes, but in fact, uh, uh, we use uh, even years such as 18 uh, and 20 and 16 uh, for presenting our winners uh, in, say, in various concerts, like we used to do a really nice concert at Carnegie Hall in 2018 in January, but we couldn't do it obviously this year. So what we were doing instead, it's, uh, uh, we're trying to present them this fall uh, on various um, technology like Zoom and we would just give them a recital with proper advertisement. And also this, uh, the e even years we use as uh, possible preselection for the future competition. So hopefully this December we will have a, a preselection uh, rounds by video. So whoever will be able to send it, uh, they can participate in 2021. Well, how many how many pianists uh, overall are participating? Well, I shouldn't just uh, say pianists. Uh, altogether, contestants. Well, we used to have applications for at least several hundreds. I would say five, six hundred applications yeah. uh, that came in in uh, 2017. A little bit less so last round because we concentrated on a fewer uh, instrumental right. groups. But nevertheless, it was a lot. It was like two, three hundred. And we merged it down into uh, 24 pianists uh, in all the group. Uh, so it was very competitive. Right. And then uh, just uh, several uh, selected pianists in the younger categories. Yeah. Also, I should wow. probably mention that um, the competition does not always take place in just in New York City, even though uh, final rounds uh, do take place. Uh, in, uh, in the center of Manhattan. But uh, we also like to do some of these events in Brooklyn, New York, uh, because I think it's very important to honor this neighborhood uh, where uh, George Gershwin was born. It will also be the opportunity for community to attend local events. Uh, in the, even if they take in a place in the central library, they can just attend and they don't have to make a trip always to the city. And it sort of uh, widens the horizon of the competition. It makes it broader. Of course. Well, of course, Brooklyn is part of New York's, uh, New York's DNA as a city. Anyway, it's, uh, it's one of our beloved boroughs. So. Um, that's very wise and very good. You're canvassing the city, <laughs> the metropolitan area. And uh, so for the pianists who are listening who might be interested in applying, how do they do that? Well, uh, we didn't open applications yet, uh, but uh, applications uh, would be out by September 30. So for those who really want to take uh, part in this uh, interesting contest, you can do so by just go into the competition website, which is www.gershwincompetition, one word, dot org. Dot org. And you so can it's... read all about it. Yeah, it's an organization. So uh, right. you, can, you can just visit this and you can read about the uh, former competitions. You can see the winners. You can hear them in action and also many other programs that we do for uh, for people who go through the competition. So just for our listeners, I will repeat in case if the connection wasn't very clear, gershwincompetition.org is the website. Correct. And they can yes. learn all about it and the applications will become available shortly. Absolutely. That's exciting. That's good. Look, how many people do work for you running this? Because it cannot possibly be all done by you. Uh, well, a lot of work I actually do myself in terms of promoting, connecting to so many different conservatories and colleges all around, uh, not just the USA, but globally. So that's how they get information about it. And of course, advertising it through online uh, sources. I like doing it actually, because I sort of found my own way of connecting to people and I like communication. 
Um, well, in terms of practical things, when the competition actually comes to New York City, of course, I have a team of several people who have been so loyal to me and they help me. And some of them are really from the Juilliard community. Uh, and they just, uh, I was so amazed by the generosity because they just volunteered for this and they wanted to be uh, part of it. And I had an amazing uh, engineer who uh, recorded the previous competition. He, his name is Luis Reyes and he was so uh, faithful and honest sitting there basically all days for many hours during the rounds and they made and producing an amazing quality of not just audio, but video for the competition. So uh, yes, uh, he has several people who actually help me to do it in practice because uh, to do it alone is uh, virtually not very poss uh, possible. Yeah, I mean, that's why I asked because it sounds impossible for one person to do all of that. Uh, do, you, uh, do, you live stream? Course, uh, do you live stream the competition? Yes, we did actually a couple of live streams, uh, not uh, uh, possibly all the rounds, but at least uh, the uh, older group, uh, which is 18 years old to uh, 36. Uh, we actually broadcasted some of their performance live. We did show the live uh, video of the finale of the competition. And uh, I probably should also mention uh, a person who was uh, super supportive uh, for me during the last competition. It's uh, my partner and very dear person to me, Anastasia Kozlova. She was uh, not only a jury member, uh, but uh, also the person who really helped me to shape up uh, the previous edition and in the form it, it took place. Yeah, that's remarkable. That's so good. Um, now, uh, the nitty gritty question that um, I just feel I have to ask. How so? The organization is a, a not-for-profit, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. So you can re receive donations, but do you have corporate sp sponsorships? Not uh, really. You know, I've been trying to raise uh, awareness of the competition for the past few editions, but it's not uh, always easy, uh, especially uh, with uh, now with the COVID time. But yes, the competition have been. Uh, with the nonprofit organization since its inception. And I had, uh, of course, some private sponsors, the people who basically love music of Gershwin and uh, those who love uh, piano music and jazz. So they, they just supported the competition with uh, the, their means. Uh, but when you say corporate uh, sponsorship, you usually mean like a big, big organizations. And I, it was my dream actually and goal to attract it to right. that because I think that the project is very, very interesting and uh, it deserves certainly to be uh, on the even loftier levels than, than it is now. Right. Well, and it's also a homegrown New York project. So um, perhaps a New York based uh, business uh, corporation, I don't know, bank, uh, there's any, anything really uh, that has a philanthropic budget, um, you know, might be interested in, in supporting such a cause. Absolutely, yes. I think uh, that it's a project which can be certainly supported, uh, for example, and I'm trying to slowly research that now. Uh, one thing is United, uh, United Airlines has uh, their main melody is, uh, from the Rhapsody in Blue. So yes. that's one of the ideas. <laughs> well, you should write them an email. They need uh, more positive PR. <laughs> Absolutely now, when, uh, especially uh, now when nobody wants to fly. <laughs> right, and but then you'll have to transport your participants to New York City and they might just fly United. That is a really great idea. Costa. There you go. Uh, uh, now, I also want to talk about your other project, uh, the music festival that takes place all the way in the Balkan countries. How, how did you find your way all the way to that other part of the world? Well, it's not Balkan, it's actually Baltic countries. Baltic, oh my God, I can't believe I just did it. All right, we're gonna, <laughs> we may or may not got it out. Difference. I know, Baltic, <laughs> I know, yeah, like a lot. Um, well, yeah, that's a blonde moment there for me. Uh, that happens. So, yes, in the Baltic, and it's much colder in the Baltic than it is in the Balkan. Um, 
it depends uh, time of the year but anyway we, we're not we're not going to go into climatic thing here right <laughs> uh with uh, with that uh, project uh, if any project that i was doing was totally unexpected for me uh, this one was uh, much more unexpected than any uh, project related to Gershwin because with the Gershwin it's uh, more or less in New York so it could be predictable to some extent but uh, founding this festival in 2014 in Estonia I was so far away from it and uh, I had some friends in Estonian consulate here who uh, attended the Gershwin competition so they uh, uh, compl uh, they gave me compliments at the reception following the first edition that it was very good organized and um, they also shared that they wanted to give uh, some kind of an idea of what to do and then uh, they actually uh, initiated a meeting and they said they wanted to do a music festival in Estonia that would uh, combine master classes with concerts and like it's been done in many countries for God knows how long, and they said uh, we were not able to do it. And as an educator, I asked them what's wrong. And they openly told me that the people who live in Estonia, and especially in the musical world, are so competitive to each other that they start doing it, start collaborating, and then it does not really work out very well. So they decided to uh, bring a person from outside. And uh, right. I said, well, now we're talking about February. Uh, so you probably mean it uh, not in 2014, but in 2015. And they said, no, we mean it for this summer. Wow. And I thought it was absolutely crazy, but I did not say no, because I was so much interested, you know, to test my uh, producing skills and how far I can go with it, how much I can stretch it to. So I started to go connection through connection, like really uh, like a chain of people. And then eventually I met a person who was eventually become one of the sponsors of this festival and she introduced me to some other people. It was a very tough work and until probably April or May, I was not even sure that it was going to take uh, place. But uh, people who I gave this idea in Estonia, they were so interested in that that they uh, gave it an initial start. And... Uh, um, I also met a person who was my partner for a while in that festival, living locally. And she lit literally went to all these churches and concert houses and asked, do you want to help? This is a new festival. So we didn't have a lot of students, which just had probably 15 people applying total. But we had some great professors for voice and piano only. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Contrast to that was the huge amounts of con uh, concerts that we roomed, like stacked up in 10 days. We had the performances that took place sometimes twice or three times per day. So it was absolutely wow. crazy. Um, but uh, what was the amazing part is that it was new for Tallinn and new for all community there. And it was completely a new experience for people who came out because they said for any other festivals that we attended, we never had opportunity to play that much. That's probably just right. an extraneous experience. <laughs> um, but many of them came back the next year because they loved uh, the environment and they loved the opportunity to be on stage and trying out all their repertoire. And Tallinn, of course, is a beautiful city. Now, does the festival grow now beyond the borders of Tallinn? Is it, is it expanding uh, within the country? Yes, yes. Well, it's uh, it's very uh, becoming very international. Uh, we expanded it already in the third year, uh, I should say second year, into uh, Latvia, Riga, where we just came mm -hmm. by bus and performed a concert. And uh, in the third year, we started collaboration with the wonderful, uh, uh, well, in English, it's translated like, like a, a rock church, and then Finnish. It's Tempele Aukion Kirko, and it's a, a church which is a historic monument in the center of Helsinki made from the huge rock. And wow. it's a gigantic building with 750 seats, 
uh, all rounded and with beautiful natural lighting. And uh, they've been partnering with us uh, every summer. Our basically festival takes place in this location and it's absolutely gorgeous to be there. But that's and, Finland. Yes, yes. So we also uh, included Finland, which is just about two and a half hours by boat from Estonia. So it's close. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Since last year, we started to also give concert in Palanga, which is uh, Lithuania. Uh, well, so, so yeah, th th I was going to ask, what about Lithuania? So you got that down too. <laughs> yeah, and it was it's amazing experience uh, after we uh, went so many uh, cities and concert halls in Estonia, we wanted to explore other countries. And my um, final idea is uh, very broad, but I um, plan to uh, um, emphasize the significance of Baltic city as the uh, inspirational tool for local communities. So uh, I don't know how far this festival is able to grow and what would be the timelines. Now I'm actually restructuring a little bit, but I hope in a few years we can do it in uh, many countries around Baltic Basin, which would include right. obviously Poland and Germany. We will see. Wow. Well, I was going to say, so this summer's festival obviously has been canceled. Uh, correct. Yes, it's one of the pains uh, uh, that I had to undergo because we had of all these uh, uh, things planned. We were uh, we we welcomed an amazing violinist coming this season, uh, who is Shlomo Mintz, and I was supposed to play with him Mendelssohn Double Concerto. Uh, with an orchestra and uh, it was all uh, canceled, but everybody saw been understanding about the station. So we changed everything to 2021. So we still in the like middle of, of the crisis, we don't know what will happen, but hopefully by next summer, more things will be possible. And again, well, uh, thanks to technology, we're gonna do a couple of performances online. Oh, good. Good to know. But that's what I was going to ask is, did you just move everything for next summer? Did you reschedule 2020 to take place in 2021? Or do you think 2021 will have to be reshaped in a way that will then become quite different from what it would have been this summer? You know, it's hard to predict uh, because even when reading articles uh, from American and international media, uh, nobody yet knows how uh, how the arts will play, but uh, uh, with uh, all the predictions taking place, it's uh, probably will be safer to just reschedule it for the next summer, because everybody predict the infections to go down significantly, then it would be more safe to do it. Um, so I, I'm planning on that, and in this fall, I'm hoping that some of the participants participants from previous editions or even teachers can uh, do like a small version of an edition to do it online like with some master classes or performances taking place and it's it would be also great to uh, showcase some of the previous uh, concerts that have been pre-recorded in Tallinn uh, as a preview of uh, the future festival. Right no absolutely you should do that and um do you, uh, for those who are interested in attending, how do they go about that? Well, uh, we did not uh, yet open the applications, so, but they can go to uh, website alienbalticfestival.com. This time it's the .com and uh, they can right. see the updates and uh, we are now actually in the process of updating the website with uh, media and photos and uh, videos from previous concerts so they can actually experience that and uh, we uh, might open applications for the next season as early as November 1st so they can actually uh, apply online and uh, send their video because uh, mm -hmm. since last year we have uh, scholarship possibilities for students so if their performance level is really good and they need again they can get tuition reduction when going for, for this event. Wow. And uh, just one, one more thing to say, I'm, I'm really planning uh, to have it next year in two countries. That it might be uh, 
partially in Estonia, partially in Latvia, because last year Latvia was the host country of this festival. And we had a wonderful um, Yashev Vitalsh uh, Conservatory participating in this, and they really uh, have a great building and all the facilities. And uh, to combine the two, uh, like you can have uh, two bases of the festival, and you can stay in two countries for a longer period of time and enjoy the environment. So that's the plan. But uh, again, it, it all hopefully will play out well with all the health regulations around the world. Of course. Yes. And the website is again, Tallinn Baltic Festival. No, 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 no Tallinn yet, uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's uh, merged into several countries. So it's right. Just, uh, so what will the website? Uh, Alien uh, Baltic Festival, A-L-I-O-N, uh, Baltic uh, Festival dot com. Dot com. Yeah, I just want to make sure because connection is not very clear sometimes and I wasn't, I didn't hear it very clearly. Um, well, we'll put the link on, in the description of the video to, to all of uh, your festival and the competition and so people can just click on it, but um, they should definitely consider it. It's a beautiful part of the world. I've been there. It's uh, very nice. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's uh, it also gives a possibility to cool yourself a little bit uh, uh, during the summertime. For me, it's uh, uh, two advantages. First, uh, I want to get out of the New York heat and to be able to have uh, something mild because summer is in the Baltic, they're really, really beautiful. And secondly, it's a part of the world which is uh, was former uh, Soviet Union although Baltic uh, countries would never want to admit that <laughs> uh, for political reasons. But to me, it's, uh, it's one of the uh, ways to go back uh, to former, uh, where I used to live like a mini Russian environment uh, without being uh, back to Russia. <laughs> right. Well, it's sort of on the cusp of the East and West Europe. Uh, isn't it that's what yes they, and this is what i what... love about it like this amalgamation of mixture of cultures and uh, they actually to me brought out all the best from the soviet union culture the monumentality and the mentality and from the west it's been so cultural and uh, they uh, on the other hand they have a lot of things from their own their own culture and uh, i it's absolutely beautiful to experience that. Now, the um, for for that festival um, and event, um, do you get some government support uh, or corporate support locally, or is it also all just privately funded? Uh, we used to have some uh, support from local organizations, uh, just uh, but it was not a very big one. So for me as a producer, uh, I understood quickly that in those smaller countries, it's not like a Germany or France where you can apply and get uh, considerable support because this uh, it's still Euro countries, but they are the ones that are very much dependent on political climate and uh, um, the competition for receiving funds is usually very great because they like to give to local established uh, festivals and organizations. And I quickly realized I don't want to be part of this group competing with them. So I built uh, the budget and uh, the uh, framework of the festival. So it would sort of run uh, independent of that. And um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, budgets covered by participation fees, participants, and partially with selling tickets for the concerts, which were of a very good quality, and it's been became very quickly known to the local community. I was fortunate to meet people who spread the word, and they could also advertise it to social media. And um, actually, this experience with the festival taught me so much uh, about uh, how the advertising works. Uh, we did it not only online, but also through posters around the city, um, the digital LG screens around the city. We even had installed our 
uh, advertisement on public transportation because they have these screens in Tallinn where you can actually do it. And um, this, this part of the work was fascinating for me as a producer because you can learn it live and you can try to predict the budget, how it's going to work. And it was absolutely fascinating to learn how it would uh, play around at the end. Amazing. Well, congratulations on all of that. That really sounds spectacular. And I'm sure that once the pandemic is behind us, it will blossom again into something bigger yet. Yes, uh, hopefully so. And hopefully, uh, you know, it will be restructured. Uh, so it uh, uh, will be um, not so big because in my previous festival used to go for one month, which I thought it was too much, but can be roomed into two weeks and we can uh, equally subdivide time between two countries and find uh, opportunity to go and perform elsewhere. Right. which is amazing it is absolutely so now as we're sort of coming up on our final chapter uh, just a few pointers uh what would you what did, would be the advice that you would give to uh young musicians right now who need to start um you know creating and building their career and promoting themselves uh that um perhaps uh, just haven't done that yet, uh, coming out of college? Well, uh, there are two points that I really want to make. One is uh, promoting yourself. Uh, I think even up to these days, even though the movement starts in the colleges to include a music business course, uh, it hasn't been uh, done enough on a national level, U.S. national level to uh, really teach uh, musicians who are coming out of college how to deal with uh, self-promotion and how to do it. Some of them intuitively do it well, like they take courses online and they really do it well. And I know some of instrumentalists who are really successful with social media, etc. Uh, but I believe uh, the key uh, really to start uh, promoting yourself is to know your love mark. And love mark is really uh, what makes you uh, stand out and make you special as an artist. It may be just a several things. It may be just an experience or an appearance. For me, I love very musical ties with a, with a keyboard or something when I perform. And uh, that's, uh, that's already has been taking a lot of photos from journalists and they kind of love putting this in. Uh, right. and, but it can be also something like from your repertoire or something in your personality that makes yourself a very special musician. And finding that, I think, is a, a cornerstone of how you would address your future career and then building your promotion around that. Um, because these days, uh, we had so many loud musical personalities uh, that stand out. It's very hard to get lost uh, behind the groove, even if you are a good musician, you need to find some kind of uh, spice in, in that which could turn it immediately attention to whatever you're doing. And I don't mean something weird that you would just uh, come out and, uh, you know, do some jogging on stage before playing something, although this would be an interesting too for some. Right. But I mean, uh, something that is just uh, different, uh, but uh, within the framework of classical music. Right. And uh, the second point I want to take is I find on the internet so many people listening to um, that they're depressed basically with this situation of COVID and uh, understandably so um, this is a terrible situation and I was uh, to a great extent, uh, you know, under that myself. I would say that at the same time, um, depression is a different, is a dangerous field because you, if you're prone to that, first of all, you're wasting time. And like I said at the beginning of conversation, the situation uh, when you can have opportunity to be with yourself and to plan future will not be uh, very long. So if you can uh, use this time efficiently to plan more for events, for your own performances, for projects that you want to do um, next year when the COVID situation does improve. 
Right. That's very good advice. In other words, stop binge watching Netflix, right? <laughs> and, and, and get on with it. Take a course, um, learn a new skill. Um, you know, I'm, I'm into uh, video editing and, uh, you know, production, all of that. Uh, obviously, it's necessary to have uh, in order to produce podcasts and things, but, you know, make um, your own music videos and things like that. So I'm just constantly watching tutorials and learning new editing uh, tricks. And, you know, there's just a wealth of information, most of which is very good and completely free, but you have to look for it. Yes, uh, absolutely agree. And uh, I think uh, this uh, this time around is... Uh when you can actually plan the future, you can have so many ideas about how to maintain your career, how even to improve you. There is also a lot of opportunities to connect to different people who otherwise would be unavailable or just blocking their uh, social networks and just emails because of uh, the busy lifestyle. Now I see a lot of this even classical music stars coming uh, like a flood of them on the social media because they're mm -hmm. really looking for more opportunities and secondly because they have more time so there is a possibility to connect to these people and sort of plan uh, ahead for uh, future absolutely that's uh, that's also something to keep in mind now a uh, real short questions and short answers that I ask everybody. Um, sure. Do you believe in practicing hands separately? I do. In fact, uh, I uh, often practice separately when I um, when I play, especially music of Bach. And uh, beyond that, uh, my own mode of practicing is, uh, which is much more difficult, is when you study a completely new piece you uh, not only read it separate, but you're trying to learn it separate page by page and at the same time memorizing it. And it's a completely new piece. So you're learning the text, but you're also learning the notes this way. And I found it very reliable and uh, it also sort of gives you a different mindset about hearing the piece in a different way. So I'm actually pro that. No, no, I agree. I do that myself, but not everybody agrees. So it's perfectly fine to disagree. Uh, what book are you reading right now? Uh, right now I'm reading a book uh, of uh, uh, Arthur Haley. He's, uh, uh, he's an American, uh, American writer of, I would say, popular in 60s, 70s, 80s. And he wrote about uh, a lot of professional novels about uh, the airport and about uh, about hotel business how it runs because it's interesting to sometimes uh, to divert your mind off the music and just to read about how other industries work so it's kind of interesting <laughs> so it's fiction it's a novel uh, yeah it's a literature but it's a it's not just a fiction it's a professional fiction where he mm -hmm. would explore the details of some profession and he would still have a plot and he would have like main characters interacting with each other, but within the framework of professional literature. The books that I'm reading now, for example, explores uh, auto industry in Detroit. And uh, I would say in the 80s when all right. these uh, cars were booming and how this industry was changing. And he goes really from the level of uh, CEO or company of president showing how they live then uh, up to the really bottom of the bookshelf with uh, all these workers on the factory and how they perceived uh, their life uh, in that That's world. That's amazing. So Sounds interesting. Really interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, what would you say to yourself at 20? Uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> what would you say to yourself when you were 20 years old? What advice would you give yourself? Oh, so I have to do a flashback. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, it's interesting. I would say just, uh, you know, uh, wait a few years <laughs> and to, to experience uh, really the things that I wanted to achieve back then and they would naturally come along.
because I remember being so impatient and like I wanted to grasp everything and like to understand. Um, actually, it's interesting you ask that because even these days I have uh, this kind of, uh, you know, impatient feeling about time, like I always want to room more things into uh, 24 hours stretching this. Uh, and at that time, I used to be more eager with that, but now I sort of uh, learned to balance the time like, more efficiently. So that's advice I would give to myself. Oh, that's very good. Um, what would you say to a parent of a music student? To be supportive. If the, if the music student is talented and especially if the uh, student is young. Uh, and uh, by supportive, I mean not just uh, uh, helping to really receive the best possible education in terms of music, uh, but also to follow the lessons. Even if you are not a musician, it, it would be much easier for your child if you just sit in and just try to write down things, even if you don't understand the hell about the music. Because uh, even small guidance and uh, whatever you say or do during these lessons might help the child to progress. And I'm saying this because I, as a music teacher, as a professor, I've been teaching a variety of students. For some of them, they're so talented that the guidance of their parents is not needed, especially if they had uh, a teacher uh, before me who really uh, taught them basics, taught them how to practice. I mean, uh, Kosti, you probably remember that in a central music school, especially at the beginning, teachers really teach you how to practice this or another style of work. Here in America, they don't really do it. Well, they do it to some extent, but the point is you really have to start uh, teaching this from the very beginning with the smaller pieces and then expanding that. Without this understanding, yes. there is no really uh, fundamental education possible, especially as far as piano is concerned. And I think at that point, it's very important to have parents participate in this process as much as mm -hmm. possible. That's a good one. What would you say to music teacher? Uh, just a general advice? Yeah, if you had to tell them one thing. I would say... Uh, develop a sense of patience towards students and develop a, an individual approach towards each student. Because over the years of teaching, and I have currently eight in my 18th year of uh, teaching, I, know, I realized that you can apply your knowledge and apply any method to students, but really how effective it could be, it really depends on the student itself. And for some students, a perfect method of teaching might work and do miracles, like they would progress and boost like this. But for the others, it may be completely wrong. And in this case, you, you need to mold uh, your educative process and, and bring in as much variety as possible until it starts to click and to work. Yeah, well, everyone agrees. Everybody I, I interviewed, we all... Um seem to agree that there is no one size fits all technique of teaching. So that is, um, that seems to be an overwhelming uh, opinion. And it's true. I completely agree. And finally, what would you say to music student? The student, I would say just uh, whatever happens to you in terms of education uh, and for music, you have to always remember to maintain your own vision and your own view on this course and uh, on the composer especially. Uh, that's of a crucial paramount importance, I would say, because uh, without this, if you just follow the teacher's advice or parent advice and you're trying to do it the right way, especially in the, in the early years, you're losing a lot of sense of intuition, like musical intuition. And it's very important to um, sometimes you even break rules and play how you feel about music and how you like it. One of the probably most famous examples is a Russian composer, Yanis Sergei Prokofiev, who had 
so many huge fights with his uh, professor Yesipova in the conservatory because she used to really be an adamant of legata touch and really big, uh, huge lines, typically Russian school. And he loved to break rules. He loved to play the cut and, you know, hyper uh, disjunct textures, which is what defines Prokofiev music as we know it today. And she used to absolutely hit it and throw him out of the uh, lesson, but he still uh, was pursuing he, what he thought was important. And that kind of uh, good musical stubbornness is absolutely what we need and what we want to see displayed uh, with the younger generation of pianists. Yeah. Good musical stubbornness. I like it. That should be his hashtag. <laughs> Well, look, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. This was the most interesting conversation. And I think it's going to be a great listen for everyone who is uh, planning on having music live professionally, uh, because it goes far beyond just practicing the piano. And you're living an example of how a pianist can be so much more and so many more roles there are to be played. Uh, you know, well, I think for, for, me, there is even, uh, for me, there is even much more to explore post-COVID. Uh, we just need to hover through this couple of months and I'm trying to find new things to uh, apply myself and I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. And, and well, it was my great you. pleasure being here as well and thank you for a wonderful interview, Kostya. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. We'll see you post-COVID on real life stage. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Take care.